with the commissioner. Now, things have changed here, and uh, why has it changed? Basically, um, the commissioner and the government, being pressured by the EU as well, uh, wanted to know exactly how many NGOs are working out there. So uh, this has made it compulsory. And also, um, a fee was introduced, uh, a fine rather than a fee. Um, for those organizations who uh, keep on tracking and saying, I will not be registered with the commissioner, will eventually be fined 120 something. Um, and 11 euro 65 daily. This hasn't been, let's say, hasn't started as yet. Uh, so we haven't charged anyone. But um, this past week, we've been working on some organizations that we have been tracking and uh, communicating with them and has since not uh, decided to apply with the commissioner. And it seems that the fine now is going to be uh, justified on them. So uh, that is why uh, I'm telling you that uh, there's a fine, but at the moment you're still fine or you will not be gonna be fined at the moment. Um, how to register with the commissioner, it's quite important. It's, this, since I said in 2018, a new law was amended, um, other sections have become more important. And I want to brief something that about the registry of beneficial owners. Um, in 2018 as well, in June 2018, uh, a new law was enacted in Brussels. And it became compulsory for all uh, NGOs uh, working in the sector. So if it's in Malta or other country, um, they had to be registered in, a, in, a, in an office in that particular country. And NGOs and limited liable companies were incorporated in the same law. So uh, before an organization applies with the commissioner, uh, they have to be registered in this uh, registry of beneficial owners. The title um, is a bit uh, obscure, it's a bit, um, out of the way because basically it's more about money laundering and terrorism. But being that there are companies in them and they have beneficial owners, uh, the title became known as the Beneficial Owners uh, Registry. Obviously, um, NGOs will not be required to fill the whole application. As you might say, as you are seeing on the on the left of the of your screen, uh, there is an application that I have downloaded from the website of the Malta Business Registry. What I did was I highlighted the parts that the uh, NGO has to fill, so it would be quite easy for anyone to fill the form because it's quite uh, there's only they only fill about two and a half pages, just the details of the organizations and the list of the committee members. It's easier if you send me an email and I will send you this application. Otherwise, you can go on the website of the Morta Registry, uh, Morta Business Registry, and download the application from there. But obviously, it will not have the highlighted parts, as I was saying. Once ready, um, once you fill the form, you will take it either personally to uh, the Malta Business Registry, uh, which now they have moved to uh, Zaytun, Labor Avenue, and they can be contacted, there is the email and telephone number. If I were you, I will uh, send them an email and explain to them that you have filled a form and you would like to apply to be registered uh, in the Registry of Beneficial Owners. As I said, you cannot do anything unless you have the application ready and certified by them. So please, you have to start from that part. Uh, you have to take with you uh, a statute of the organization. Make sure it is signed by all committee members. When I say all committee members, it doesn't mean the president, secretary, and the treasurer, but all committee members that have a voting right to sit in this board. Um, 
once you hand in the application to, to them, now if you're gonna send it by email or you're gonna send it by post or you hand it manually, um, you need to ask them to give you uh, a certified copy of the application. It's highly important because to start the online application, which as I um, it is written on this page is cvoenrollment.gov.md, you must have a copy of this application. Okay? Kind of make sure that all documents required on the application when you go online with the commissioner are scanned and saved on your computer. It is highly important because once you start doing the online application with the commissioner, you'll be required to submit certain documents. Over here, I have two important ones. Later on, the other others will crop up. Um, statute, and again, the statute must be the same one that you have given to the Mortar Business Registry. Also, signed, and you should include the names, surnames, ID cards, and designation. For anyone who doesn't know what designation means, I know you know, but designation means president, secretary, treasurer, and so on, okay? Resolution letter, this is highly important uh, because a resolution letter, you must inform the commissioner that you have passed a resolution during your uh, board meeting that you want to register with the commissioner. Doesn't need to, to write a whole, whole page, just say that you passed a resolution during a committee meeting taken on a certain date, uh, and you would like to apply to be enrolled with the commissioner. Obviously, the letter must be signed in the same manner as the statute. So you need to have the uh, names, surnames, ID card, designation of each committee member. Other documents are administration reports. Now, people ask me, what is an administration report? It can be known as annual report. It can be known as activity report or administration report. It doesn't matter. You just to have to give what did the organization do throughout the year, the past year. So this report, which could be a pager or, or more, uh, has to be signed by two committee. Now, before 2018, the, sig this, the signatory was just one. Now it went up to two for uh, security purpose. Financial accounts. Now, financial accounts must be signed by two committee members. It needs to be done in a way that, what was the income of the organization? A breakdown of the income, a breakdown of the expenditure, funds movements for that particular year. Signed by two committee members. Now we come for the certified copy that I've mentioned earlier about the registry of beneficial owners. Here, you must scan it, the one that you are given by the office of the uh, uh, Morta Business Registry, and save it on your computer. Another thing that came to, uh, to be as of 2018, the introduction of the police good conduct. In Maltese, we call it the condotta. Of all committee members, again, we cannot go beyond the, the, the first three administrators. It doesn't work that way, but all committee members. The uh, police conduct cannot be more than six months old. So it has to be a recent one. Okay? Uh, a copy of ID cards on both sides. And at one point, it will ask you for a signature. Just uh, nowadays, the computer will ask you for a signature. To save you the trouble, I'm saying, listen, in this case, upload again the resolution letter. It will ha obviously, there will have more signatures in it, so you are in the, in, in, in the clear in this matter. When the uh, Office of the Commissioner um, receives the uh, online application, they will be vetted in according to law. It's important that uh, each document is vetted from the Office of the Commissioner. 
And uh, one thing that uh, has been introduced uh, since April of last year is the due diligence of all the names of the committee members. The names will be checked through the relevant sources and through social media. Nowadays, the media gives a clear picture of what's going on. We check them for any wrongdoing that might be uh, criminal or, or, or something that uh, is listed in the law. If a person is found for some reason or another not to be compliant, then such person shall be discreetly asked by the commissioner to resign from being a board member. Now, what do I mean discreetly? We do not go on the balcony and start shouting and everything. We do not go to the organization and tell them that this person has been notified of any wrongdoing. We speak only to the person concerned. We ask him at the, moment, the first time politely but directly to resign. If that person does not want to resign, then enrollment to the organization depends on what action the administrators takes. So we don't want to uh, go out and ask the, admin, the, the whole organization what's going on. It's the person who is uh, found to be not compliant, it's his duty to speak to the rest of the board and tell them that he's resigning. Whatever reason he says doesn't matter, but for us, he must resign. Uh, under no circumstances does the commissioner divulge what has been found or who passed on the information to his office. As I said, um, we go beyond the uh, social media. We have our resources, police and other sources where we check. We do not say from where we got our information. We just say that we got this information and don't ask us what you have done. Surely you know what you have done. Investigations by law goes as far as 10 years. So if something happened throughout, throughout the 10 years, surely you know what you did wrong. Uh, so it's quite important that uh, the board should know exactly um, what's going on. Once all documents are satisfied uh, and the due diligence comes clear and correctly, uh, the commissioner will authorize the issue of the uh, certificate of enrollment. When the organization is issued a certificate, uh, it will be given a VO number. The VO number is a unique number. And uh, since the certificate um, is, and is considered by law, uh, equivalent to an ID card, the certificate is never, under no circumstances, sent by post, but the uh, committee or the board have to send someone on their behalf to collect the certificate, provided that the person who comes is in possession of his ID card. There is a form that needs to be filled, a copy of the ID card is taken, and the person signs this document that he or she collected the certificate. A copy of this uh, form is then filed in the file of the organization. We do it in the purpose so that we know who collected the certificate and there won't be any uh, arguments that the organization never got the certificate in the first place. As I said, it's a unique and no other copies of the certificate can be provided. Obviously, if for some reason, the certificate has been misplaced, genuinely misplaced or destroyed. Um, there's a way by the organization can do an affidavit at an office or a vote or a notary. And we will issue um, the certificate of enrollment, a new one. As part of the accountability and transparency, uh, the organizations shall be required to submit annual returns on a yearly basis where 
my colleague will, will speak later uh, about them. Now, I want to mention back, I go back forward and, and remind you that since 2008, when the law was amended, registration with the Commission became compulsory, included two registries. Now we have two registries instead of one. For those organizations who want to register in the first registry, we call it enrollment, can do so by filling the form, which is online, as I showed you. But there's another registry. We call it the enlistment registry. This is for organizations who have an income of less than 5,000 a year. If they feel that they don't, should not register themselves in the first registry, they can register in the second registry. This until we uh, rearrange the system on our computer and, 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 and with, the, with, the ho with our host, uh, has to be done manually. But uh, you can send me an email, I will send you the application and tell you exactly what documents are required. But there's a catch. Being enrolled with the commissioner in the first registry entitles you for all the benefits that there are out there. So you can apply for funds, you can do public collections, you can do so many things. Projects, you can contact the council for the bond sector and gives you all the information. You can check their website, uh, which gives all the uh, funds and projects they have at the moment. But being registered as in, in the enlistment registry stops there. You cannot do public collection unless you have a permit, but you also you cannot apply for funds. So these are two options which you need to decide. Should I go for full enrollment or should I go for enlistment? What's the, what's the difference in the administration fee? Because people ask me, what is the difference between the administration fee? Administration fee, because we don't have actual fee, it's administration fee and people only once. Being enrolled with the commissioner is only 40 euro, and you only pay it once. If you go for enlistment, it's 20 euro, and stops there. But obviously, as I said, you will lose certain aspect. If, you, if you're willing, if you have a project in your mind to go, you won't be able to do it if you want to enlist it. There are organizations, uh, university organizations, I think there are one or two, I'm not sure, um, that are enlisted. So I'm not saying don't go for that. Decide, be concise, speak to between yourself. Where do we need to go? What is the difference if I go for enlistment? Are we going to supposed to give the commissioner the same documents on a yearly basis if we are enlisted compared to voluntary organization? Tell you the truth, there's not much difference. Now it's up to you. Thank you so much for uh, listening to my uh, brief speech. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, you may ask them right now or later, up to you. Maybe we can give like two or three minutes for anyone to type out any questions. Um, if you would like, you can type out the questions or else you can also just unmute yourself and ask the question. We can also have meetings with them, okay? Uh, individual meetings, I didn't mention that. You can ask for a setup meeting and we can discuss further the, uh, basically I tackled everything, but uh, there's always a, a story for everybody. So, um, Liam Hassar asks, what is the exact difference in, do in the documents necessary to be submitted when enlisting with the, with the BO or, in, or enrolling in the so Right. The um, the one being enrolled with the commissioner, uh, it was in the uh, in the presentation. You need to uh, to submit the statute. You need to present the uh, resolution, uh, annual report, uh, financial accounts, organizational chart, um, 
and so on. They are listed there. In the case of enlistment, uh, the application was also a resolution letter. So uh, you all you all need to submit with the application uh, is the uh, financial accounts, the uh, resolution apart, just the names of the of the administrators and in their details, um, police conduct, and obviously the. Uh, Motor Business Registry, which is compulsory to everybody. So technically, the only thing that you're not going to submit to the commissioner is a copy of the statute and uh, and an and administration report. That's those two. So it's nearly the same, nearly the same. Just admi administration report and statute. There will be no need to go for you to give them to the commissioner. And maybe you can also explain: Would it be possible to have your organization? And first, and then go on to right. Good question. Um, yes, you can have the organization enlisted, but as I said, we will check to see whether the income is below 5,000 euro. Okay. The law also say that if the organization exceeds 5,000 euro for three consecutive years, then automatically it will lose its status as an enlisted organization and have to be enrolled with the commissioner. Your organization may also ask the commissioner on its own, in, in, in its own way, whatever it likes, listen, we are not happy here and enlisted. We are not getting what we wanted. We want to go for enrollment. That can be sorted out. Discussions will be on the way. We have this, we meet with the organization and we sort it out. It can be done. We haven't had one yet at the moment, but it can be done. Okay. Uh, Thomas is asking, is there a particular format which we need to follow uh, for the documents to, to be able to submit the documents? Oh, there are, there are. Um, what you need to do, you can, um, you can send your details to, uh, to the KSU, all right? And I will send you a link, which is on our website. It will give you uh, the wording, word by word, how to do a resolution, how to do that, how to do that. It will give you word by word. It doesn't give you, um, it doesn't tell you what to do in the administration report because it's something that belongs to you. But it can show you what an organization in charge is. I believe that yours is a flat one. We call it a flat one. A flat one means where you have the committee and members. That's called a flat one. If we go for a band club, it's not a flat one because a band club usually have uh, subcommittees. So, so when you put it, it's like a family tree. So when you're putting down the uh, the, the organization graph of the of the, of of your, of your organization. Um, Basically, it's just the name of the organization, uh, the committee, and it's made up of president, secretary, treasurer, PRO, and so on. And then from above, where, where the name of the organization is, comes out the, 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 the members. Doesn't come out from the committee, because the committee is elected by the, by the members. I did not mention earlier that the, um, there are three legal forms in this aspect. In NGOs, in every NGO, there are three legal forms. I take, I took it lightly because 99%, if I'm not 100, the NGOs, the uh, NGOs in the, uh, in the university are mostly associations. They have members um, and then they have elections and so on. I haven't met with a foundation but there are foundations, but at the moment, registered with the commissioner coming up from university, uh, we do not have foundations. But so that you know, there are three legal forms, which are association, foundation, and trust. So how do I become an association? How do I become a foundation? You become an association once the certificate has, sorry, the, the, the statute has been certified by the committee. Once the 
there's been an AGM or AGM, and they decided to go for uh, the name of the organization and the regulations, once it's certified, signed by the committee, that's the time when the organization became an association. In the case of foundation, they need to go to a notary to uh, do a deed, uh, constitute deed, which can be done inter vivos, we say it, uh, by living people, or by a will. Um, I'm not a lawyer, but I know certain words in Latin, which uh, helps me a lot in this way. Um, a, a trust can be done either by a lawyer, by a notary, or a bank. Uh, nowadays, the bank are not doing them the God of what we pass through. But um, it can be done, all right? Um, I didn't go into details about this because I'm 100% sure that the organizations uh, within the university are associations. Okay? Any more questions? Yes. Um, so, are you any of new organizations that have already been enrolled, for example, 10 years ago, um, need to re enroll according to the new legislation in order to be able to provide additional documents, such as ID card copies and the police conduct of the new executive board members? Okay. So, would they need to be re enrolled or would they? Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to um, answer it the first part, and then um, Sir Rodrigo will tell you the rest. Um, as I said in my presentation, when an organization is enrolled with the commissioner, it is given a VO number, which is a unique. That can never change. Now, if the organization has a backlog, of uh, documents, uh, I'm sure Mr. Rodrigue will, will be in a better position to say uh, from his part. Good morning, everybody. Um, well, basically, I will, um, in my presentation later, I will uh, speak about the, the documents which you need to submit on an annual basis. And that would include um, uh, as much as possible because we are very much aware of the difficulties that uh, um, uh, students' organizations face uh, because of the, of the changes that, that uh, they experience in their executive uh, committees, in their committees. So we're very much aware about that. Um, uh, so we can help you with um, updating and submitting um, what uh, you need to submit, what the organization needs to submit to become compliant once, uh, once again. Um, uh, obviously, if, if, uh, if there are um, documents which are missing and, and they go back to, to six, seven, eight years ago, um, uh, we can't do anything about that, but um, the organization will not get stuck in, in a rut, to, which goes back to, to six years ago because uh, the students had, had left. Um, but this is also an issue of governance. So, so you need to prepare um, always. You need to, 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 to have a, some kind of regulations or some kind of policy which uh, helps which helps the organization to hand over the the the, 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 the which helps the committee um, in its handing over to to the to the following committee so that um, mistakes from the past will not be repeated but i will speak uh, later in my presentation about uh, going to into detail about the annual tax all right, thank you. Um, we have another question from Isaiah Rabiolo, who is asking, do the financial accounts that are required to be submitted have to go back one year or not? Are we talking about new organizations or no? New organizations uh, have to submit financial. No, it's quite easy. We are in 2020, right? And to give the commissioner the financial accounts, you must give them the last financial accounts that the organization passed on through the General Assembly, through the uh, AGM or AGM. 
So it has to be of the, of the previous year and signed by two committee members. Now, let's focus on the, on the uh, financial accounts. The law gives three definitions, three legal forms in the way of how to submit financial accounts. There are three categories. The first category, which mostly of, most of you fall, is category one. It says that if the income of the organization, when we say income, we're talking about gross income and not, and not net, okay? Gross income from zero to 50,000, zero to 50,000. That is called in-house accounts. So you can do in-house accounts if you have that income. If you exceed the 50,000 up to a maximum of 250,000, then you need you require the signature of an accountant. Of, and if you exceed 250,000, then you require to have to do audit accounts. So actually, category two, it's it's a it's a gaps me. Um, those of you who are studying account would know what gaps me is. So so gaps me is a mini audit. A, a small audit. That's why Sebastian was saying that you need uh, the, 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 the signature of an accountant or an auditor, better still. Um, but you would need to, 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 to submit also a balance sheet. Um, a balance sheet and, and even better, and in the annual returns, we would start um, requesting it we want an opinion from the account it's not just about numbers it's about uh, it's about having an accountant um, uh, not just signing but putting an opinion it is not a full ifrs audit that that those are left for uh, organizations whose income uh, exceed the 250,000 uh, euros and but it's, it's for those organizations whose income is between 50K and 250K, then you need uh, a gaps me uh, and uh, an account, like the, the, the format. It's a, part, it, it's, it's a particular format of, 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 of accounts um, and it's not cash basis, it's accrual. It's, a, it's accrual. But we'll go in um, about these uh, later on when we when we, we speak about uh, the annual returns. So we have another question, um, which seems to be the last question, but obviously if anyone else would like to ask anything, especially to Mr. Sebastian Michalle, because then we'll be moving on to the presentation by Mr. Kutadus, uh, please feel free. So the last question which we have for now is from Lynn Shiklumna, who is asking, are organizations to have an income of less than 5,000 euro Still eligible to apply with the enrollment registry? Yes. Enrollment is open to everybody. It doesn't matter if you have an income of less than 5,000. I've mentioned the enlistment because obviously it is written in the law. And it was made up because we had a lot of requests by smaller organizations who have no objective in a way. They just want to exist. But if your organization has less than 5,000 a year, but you have a vision um, as, as we speak, then I suggest you go for enrollment. Being enrolled with the commissioner, if I'm gonna give an example, if the, com if the government, because um, we usually we get income uh, budgets and everything from the government. If the government wakes up one day and says, I'm going to give 1,000 euro each to each organization that is enrolled with the commissioner. I hope it does, but uh, it's, a, <laughs> it's a dream. Um, only those organizations that are enrolled with the commissioner will benefit. Okay? Those that are enlisted are there to be known to the commissioner that they exist. But you don't have rights being enlisted. Tell you the truth, it's more easier for me and my staff to do enlistment, all right? 
less work for us. But I'm telling you from experience that best to be enrolled with the commissioner in the first registry. There's only a 20, 20 euro difference, but not enough. Go for it. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, we don't seem to have any more questions for the moment for the time being. So I would like to thank you for your presentation you. and for answering our questions. Um, um, now we can move on to the next part of the workshop, um, uh, which will be presented by Mr. Rafael Jones, as I said, and he will be tackling the annual returns aspect of the application for the policy organization. Okay, so um, so once again, good morning, everybody. Um, my my responsibility uh, at at the office of the commissioner is to to vet with my with my staff the annual the annual returns. So okay, so. The, basically, the um, yes, I'm sorry, I need to remove because I can't read the, the slide. One moment, please. Can can you remove those? Uh, the... okay. So yes. Um, so first of all, before let me share something. Um, which Yasmin spoke uh, about in the beginning. I've been involved with, with voluntary organizations since 1988, um, when I was a full-time student at, at university. So you can calculate my age quite uh, um, in a simple manner. Um, I used to describe myself, I still do actually, as having two parallel careers. One which pays the bills and not necessarily offers the best of satisfaction, and another one which offers a lot of satisfaction, and that is my work in NGOs. So I've worked in NGOs, I've worked full time with, with, uh, on a full time basis uh, for three years, um, and that was very interesting. I, I I've worked locally and, and on, on a European level as well. So please do not be discouraged when uh, the going gets tough, when your members do not turn up or for, for, for your activities or not many members turn up for your activities. Just enjoy the moment because what you will be learning from these, from your activism in the students' organizations, as I was telling Matthew and Yasmin, you will not get in, a, in any lecture, your lecture room at university. And I used to lecture over here, so I know what I'm saying. Um, so so it's, 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 the, the, the work that you're doing is valuable and is very, very important. But then you need to realize that you need to, 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 to think about that we're working in, within a legal framework. When we were students at, um, at university, initiative and work was more important than governance, than sustainability, than uh, development of the organization than having a statute within itself. And then these things used to come later. But in reality, in today's world, we cannot afford. And that is why we have, um, apart from the, 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 the Voluntary Organizations Act, which in my opinion is not the best way how to describe the organizations, I'd rather have the European name, what, what is used in many of the, the EU states 
that is NGOs, non-governmental organizations, than voluntary organizations. Because the word voluntary gives automatically, it gives a certain uh, direction. It takes you to a certain place, which is not, um, uh, which is not reality. Um, in, in, in the UK, they call them charities, which is even worse, I believe. Um, but, but then they, they, they seem not to be able to learn anything, but that's another story. Um, but so, so the name is very, really and truly um, uh, a, bit, a bit, I think it's, it, it needs to be revised. So the, the scope, then we have the, the, the subsidiary um, uh, legislation, the, the legal notice, which is the annual account and the annual returns. So basically, you have enrollment, which Sebastian was, my colleague Sebastian was explaining, and then every year you need to submit a set of documents. We're not speaking about nuclear physics over here. We're speaking about a set of documents, but, but, which need to be built up during the year. And that is the challenge, which many people uh, fail to do, and obviously, I understand perfectly because um, writing a report after an activity takes out um, practically the excitement of the activity. And, but it needs to be done. It needs to be done. Um, so these regulations are meant to ensure transparency and accountability. If I had to ask you a question, and I'm not expecting answers, about what was the income and generated revenue of voluntary organizations in 2018? Because in 2019, due to COVID, we're still uh, waiting for, for the annual return. So that is what, what we can uh, base our arguments on, 2018. The ones which have actually submitted their annual returns Believe it or not, and I think it's a conservative estimate, it's 80 million euros in one year. That is the income and generated revenue. So you can understand, you can all understand why transparency and accountability is so important. It is so important. So, in the preparation and submission of annual returns and the, by VOs carrying out activities intended to achieve the principal purpose and objectives of such organizations. NGOs everywhere, but especially in certain countries, and sometimes it happens even in our country, they are attacked. They are attacked by people who um, either have nothing better to do in life or simply um, they are so, so, so afraid of change that they can't really understand that the world is, 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 has become a huge city nowadays. Um, so, so we have a lot of attacks. I remember working with colleagues from Hungary, for example, and they were sure that their telephone, the, 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 the telephone sets in their offices, they were tapped very sure. They were very, 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 very sure. This is not pre-Berlin uh, Wall, uh, pre-1989. This is 2015, 2016, European Union, a full member of the EU. So let's not take <clears throat> our democracy for granted, because it is not uh, a given, but it is something that we need to work on continuously. So, oops. All right. Okay, all right, okay. Yeah. So, Sebastian mentioned the categories, and the categories, he, he mentioned them, and so it's from zero to 50,000. There was a question about whether if you have less than 5,000, you can enroll. Yes, because 
um, the, the income and the generated revenue is not something which is uh, an essential. Obviously, it is important, very important, but it's not essential. Category two, um, we're speaking about between 50 to, to 250K, and category three, it's, it's more than uh, 250K. Do you get, um, I think even in, at, at university, we have category two, and I think KSU would be category three. Um, so, so, or, or the early oh, there, yes, yeah, so it depends on how, but that's everyone, <laughs> that's, 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 it's always the same. But, but we have category two organizations, so it's, uh, and at the end of the day, it all, it all depends on the ability of the organization to dream big. Like mentioned, okay. you need to dream big, so worry. No worry, I'm not a brainstorming exercise. And as stupid as, as, as an idea might sound at that moment, it can be a brilliant idea, um, actually. And in today's world, when we speak about funding, the reality is that the Ozen Malta has never experienced the type of funding that we have today. And that is very important, because without funds, they cannot uh, operate. That is why the voluntary, the word voluntary, really and truly is a bit uh, misleading. So, what does income refer to? And I am, I am quoting the, the, the regulation. So, um, Sebastian referred to the gross income. Um, we often come in conflict even with accountants because they would, uh, interpret or reinterpret um, the law. We're speaking about not what is left, not the surplus determines the category, and then it determines the uh, the reporting, but the income. So subsidies, grants, donations, um, but does does not include internal transfer. If you have a um, a, a parent organization and it has other smaller organizations that is not that it, and, and it gives money to one of its um, uh, affiliated organizations no because that is that has enough that is a, a separate legal entity so any cash deposits made to the organizations or any other transfer of funds any donation in kind relating to any property assets um, etc. Corporal, incorporal, movable or immovable, tangible or, in, uh, or intangible. This presentation will be made available to you. So there you, you have the parameters of what income re, uh, refers. So the general requirements relating to annual returns and annual accounts. And this is where I um, uh, was speaking about the handing over and the issues that students organizations have are still facing and have faced in the past. So the administrators, the responsibility lies with the, with the administrators. It is always that way. We know the administrators. We don't know the, the, the members of the organization. We know the, the, the administrators. So the administrators shall prepare and will returns in accordance with um, um, with schedules two and three of the of the uh, legal notice, um, but we will send out the office will send out in January generally, usually um, uh, a reminder about the the annual um, uh, the annual returns and the appropriate um, uh, documentation which needs to be filled in. She, it, the, the, the annual returns shall contain all the information on the activities carried out by the organization during the respective financial year. This is extremely important. A financial year needs to be included in the statute. A financial year can be anything. Obviously, it cannot exceed 12 months, because that's a year. 
but it does not need now with the new um, uh, legal notice, it does not need to be from the 1st of January to the 31st of December, yeah. although we are preparing. Although I prefer it that way, and I believe that for the sake of handing over, students' organizations should follow that model because the administrators would know that, they, that their financial year does not end when the course, when their university course ends, which usually it's a June. Um, so the financial year does not change automatically. You cannot have a financial year which states 1st January to 31st December and an activity report which covers a different set of 12 months. You cannot. It's one year, one financial administrative reporting uh, year. The annual accounts of a voluntary organization shall establish, establish sorry, the methods adopted to ensure that all income and expenditure is properly recorded and that there is transparency. This is extremely important, extremely important. That is why um, you need to be organized. It is not nuclear physics and Excel will do magic for you, um, an Excel sheet. Um, but the problem lies when, um, and, this, and this is very important to understand because VOs are experiencing real difficulties when opening bank accounts. Real difficulties. We're trying, I've, I've, I will not repeat the words I told HSBC because they were rude. But HSBC, please, and I'm, I'm being very, very um, uh, diplomatic. Um, they don't want views. That is the that is the the, the, the reality. But we we have um, we do work well with the other banks. So, but we need a bank. We need a bank account because a bank account with the, through the statement can give you a a a, a day by day um, uh, progress of of the of, of the expenditure. And you won't have any surprises at the end of the day, at the end of the of the year. The annual accounts sh shall also establish that the voluntary organization is non-profit. This we need to explain. FEO does not make profit, but it does make a surplus. A surplus of funds. It's called sustainable financial management. So it is okay to have a surplus at the end of the year because that money remains in the organization. Those finances remain in the organization. And then they are used the following year. And then the other income of the following year, it is added, it, it is added to them. It is very, very important that um, there is a surplus and not a deficit. But it's not, the, the non-profit means that the, 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 the extra money generated by the organization does not go to the members or to the board. It remains within the organization. Okay, form and content, so basically, there, are, there is a list of um, documents which you would need to, to fill in. Um, organizational chart, list of administrators, as on the last day of the respective financial year. So if in the meantime, if in the meantime, members of the board have changed, then you need to fill in two lists of administrators we need to have the proper list documents amending the statute obviously um, confirmed by the, by uh, uh, an annual general meeting or an extraordinary general meeting 
a copy of the annual report, an activity report. We have a template for that as well. So it's easier for you to fill in, um, uh, to fill in the, the annual report. A copy of the annual account, if it's um, category one, authenticated by at least two administrators. Um, if it is, um, as I explained before, uh, it depends on the category. But definitely always signed by two administrators and then an auditor or an accountant as the case may be. In the case of public collections, and I'm going to explain um, what public collections are. A statement of account relative to any event or so what is what is a public collection? So if you're organizing a wine and pizza, you're over 18, so you can all drink wine now. Um, but if you're organizing for your members and the, the and you, you arrange with, with a restaurant and you make an arrangement with, 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 with the owner and say, okay, uh, the cost is 15 euros, so 15 euros goes to the restaurant, but then you charge 20 and 5 euros goes to the organization. That is not public collection because it is for the members. It is for the members. So if the members get somebody, a guest, who's not a, it's for the members. Let's not complicate life unnecessarily. But, but, if that wine and pizza is open for all university students, members and non-members, we're not speaking about one now, or two, or a couple, we're speaking about tens of students enjoying themselves, meeting together, that is a public collection, and you would need to fill in the, 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 the state. The statement, basically, it is made up of three parts. So you have the, the expenses. Sorry. You have the income generated, the expenses generated by the activity, and the beneficiary. That is, you can give the money, you can either keep the money for your organization, or you can donate the money. Community chest fund. Data providenza. Any other organization, any other volunteer organization. They still have to fill it. Even though but they still, but you still have to fill it. And, and that income and expenditure, it needs to be reflected in your account. Because things are being checked. Now, another important point is that you need to keep a copy of the records for at least 10 years. Matthew. Exactly, yes. It does. It does. does. Always in, not out. It does. Sometimes it happens. Sometimes it happens. Income tax charge you on the income that you get, not how you spend it. It, it, it happens that an organization or, um, goes for a public event and nobody turns up, unfortunately. That's happened. It happened, even to us. So, okay, then there are um, the info, more, more points on, on, the, on the annual returns, on the form and the content of the annual returns, the information regarding the activities carried out by such volunteers during the respective financial year shall be entered in, in the annual report. The annual report to specify, obviously, it, specified, uh, it needs to specify the respective year, financial year to which the report refers. It contains a summary which describes the principal activities. So it's very, it's very simple. That's why I said it's not nuclear physics. The, the only issue is that um, if you're organized and if you put in an Excel sheet or a Word document and you start filling in, even a table would help, and you will start filling in um, the, the, 
the activities as you as you as as you go along. Then at the end of the year, when you start to, when when you're writing your report and filling in your report, basically it, it, it is it is a, a formatting exercise more than anything else. It needs to be dated and signed by at least two administrators. This is very important. It needs to be signed by two administrators. Okay, um, I, I spoke about the financial uh, the finances. This formation referred to, and this may also be submitted in electronic format. Nowadays, you can send everything by email. Um, you print, uh, you sign, you scan, and you send by um, uh, by email to to the office. So that's that's very very convenient. In the future, and I'm not committing myself to a time frame over here, um, we hope, we hope that it would be submitted online in a portal and, and that would be available um, for the public. This is very important. The documents submitted by the VO, they are in the public domain. We get um, uh, requests from journalists, from the general public, to see the file of a particular organization. You cannot turn up at the office and expect to see a file there and then. You send an email, you phone, you, you do a, your request in writing, and then you're given a date when to come to the office. And in normal circumstances, not in, 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 in COVID-19 circumstances, and you're given the, the, the file. The file there are certain things which are not in the public domain, but others, but other but documents like the statute, the annual returns, they are all the, the, the deeds of the foundation, they are all public um, public do domain. Um, and we do get these type of, of requests. That's why it is very important that you keep copies of the um, of the annual returns. So Financial reporting. This is um, this is the, the 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 biggest headache. This is the biggest headache. So category one VOs basis of accounting on a cash basis. You need to a cash basis means that the 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 income and expenditure is real. Um, what you get in and what you pay. Category two the basis of accounting accrual basis. Um, I've already mentioned gaps me. That is, if I have a, a, if I have been, I applied, successfully applied for a project, and I know I'm going to get 30,000 euros. I have a, a, I have a letter. I have a letter from the funder. I have an email from the funder telling me that the project has been approved and that uh, my, my, my budget has been approved approved for um, 30,000 and, it, and uh, my financial year is from 1st January to 31st December and I get this, this letter in November. Then those 30,000, they need to be um, uh, accounted for as income. I know that they will be um, spent in the following year, in the following financial year and they will be um, uh, noted in the expenditure as well. It is not about, uh, that's what accrual basis um, uh, mean, at least my, our, our um, technical staff, that's how they, they, they explain it. Obviously, when we say category three and diaphragm, that is all accrual basis. That is always the, the way how to, how to um, report um, uh, the, 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 the finances. So, basically we're speaking about six documents um, which need to be submitted. And we return template, sign, important, very important, it is sign. The annual returns template basically gives us the opportunity to realize who's who in the organization. 
and the person who is making the, the submissions because that is uh, that's where the communication takes place the organizational chart um, uh, the organizational chart the list of administrators if the list of administrators hasn't changed from the previous year the signatures are not required the signature is required of the new members and the copies of the identity card. I'm going to interrupt one thing. When he says hasn't changed, if you are a if you are a chairman, and then you become a secretary, for the record of the commissioner, the committee hasn't changed. All right, so that's what he's saying. So if you you lose your post as a as a as a chairman, and then you become a secretary or treasurer or or or, or a member of the board. It you is are, the same. It is the same group of people. It's the same, people. It's the same group of people. That's what the administrative report, which I have um, spoken about, and we have developed a template for that, the financial accounts, and the statement for public collection. Now, for students' organizations, which I believe are all associations, if, if that what if it makes sense, these the, um, the, 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 the administrative report, the financial account, the statement, the financial account, they need to be um, um, approved by an annual general meeting or an extraordinary general meeting. Then there's another thing. If during the annual general meeting you have changes to the statute, we need to know about those changes because those changes need to be according to the VOA, to the Voluntary Organizations Act. So, we would need the organizations to submit a document with track changes. So, you, 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 you print a, the, the statute, with, statute. With, with, with the track changes. And then you print another statute, a clean one. And you send them both. So that we can follow the changes and make sure that the changes are according to to law. I'm, I'm done with my presentation, so if there are questions which we, we, we need, if the participants have, I'd be more than happy to answer. Thank you for your presentation. I think it was very informative. Now we'll give a couple of minutes. Once again, for everyone to ask any questions, um, we will follow the same procedure, so if you have any questions, you will are free to either just unmute yourself and ask a question, or else some of the members is uh, um, only the members of the, the administrators. They need to submit them in terms. The, then there's the administrators that are listed in the commission register, um, liable to any action taken. Check it in my the Tier committee A. What are the members? Is the committee A or? So, um, just as a general note, um, as an extra point on what um, Mr. Sebastian Pallet was mentioning before, um, you can access information on funds and projects which you are able to apply for once yeah, you are a uh, volunteer organization from the Malta and CBS website. So, the website would be www dot we'll be writing it in the chat as well, so we can follow that. Um, I don't know whether there are any questions. But, um, yes. So the, the what happens after the submission of the reports? Basically, the office, the team, the annual returns team would start the vetting process. The vetting process, um, if there are no queries, if it's a straightforward vetting, if, if the, the audit, the, the, the annual account, it makes sense, so there are no, we have no issues, then we issue what we call a certificate of compliance. That certificate of compliance is the door to funding in Malta and EU and possibly EU, but 
the EU would ask for enrollment certificate rather than a compliance certificate. A reason. And, but in Malta, you need to be compliant. Why? Because every ministry, every public sector organization, that is everything which is funded by the government, needs to check with the office whether that organization is enrolled and compliant. And it's a regulation. If they don't, they lose it. They, they're in deep trouble. But they need to justify why. Um, uh, and, and, and organizations do look out for funding of other organizations, especially if they miss out on. Obviously, this is it's all a competition at the end of the day. Funds are not available for everyone, for every organization. The, the certificate of compliance has an expiry date. 12 months. So, so it's, it's, it's more than 12 months, actually, because Plus. The, the, you need to, to give the, the time. So basically, a Category 1 organization has three months after the end of the financial year to submit their um, uh, their own returns. <laughs> a category two would have four. four. A category three eight. would have eight. Then we have a, 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 a special group of VOs, foundations especially, where their statute says that their annual accounts need to be audited and it doesn't depend on the income. It, they just impose it on themselves to have their accounts audited. Those organizations have six months to submit their, their annual returns. And it's very important to understand there are time frames. That is why it is very important that the student organizations choose their uh, financial year wisely. If, if you have exams in February, then probably it is not ideal to have a financial year which ends in December, although I might be contradicting myself, but the way the, 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 univer the university program works, you need to be, your studies are more important. Let me be, um, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking from experience and speaking maybe as a parent now of a university girl. So um, your studies are first and foremost, because you're playing around with your careers. But um, this work you do is important as well. So that, that's why you need to be a bit wise when choosing the, the, uh, the financial year. The certificate of compliance, like the certificate of enrollment, is what in public policy we call a public instrument. So it, not, it is not the property of the organization, but is the property of the regulatory body. It is given, but it can be taken back. So, I issue what happens. So, KSU sends in their um, and we return, we vet, and we issue um, compliance. No problem. A month after the after we issue the certificate of compliance, we receive a complaint and we start investigating. And that complaint is substantial. Justified. It's justified. That certificate of compliance can be retrieved by the commissioner. And it is suspended. And it is suspended. So it's not only it is not only about the certificate of um, about the annual returns, but it is about keeping the organizations uh, truthful to their objectives. So that is why it's very important um, to think and discuss when, when, when deciding on the formation of a student organization. Do it, by all means, do it. But if it needs a three-hour discussion, if it needs a six-hour discussion, take it. Take those, take those six hours. 
it's not a problem. So as a clarification, when a student organization or any other uh, voluntary organization is enrolling, they would first, so as, as a first um, document, they would receive the certificate of enrollment. But then they have to continue submitting. And they are considered as compliant exactly. at that stage. And then they would need to continue submitting the necessary documentation so they each year they can receive yes. the this year, certificate this of year, compliance. Due to COVID-19, we suspended the submission date. But when we had to issue a deadline, the deadline is next Tuesday. We know that's a public holiday. Um, it's on the 8th of September. So those organizations which were due to submit their um, annual returns by the end of March, and they did not be due to COVID, they are still considered as compliant until next Tuesday. Next Wednesday morning, their compliance ends because they haven't submitted the, the annual accounts as yet. And... The, the accounts have not been uh, vetted. What we do is, we obviously, we are in continuous communication with the funders, with the local funders, obviously. And I definitely not asking uh, for the organization's for the also tax exempt. Uh, uh, oh. mm. um, <laughs> well, it, the tax, it's a very taboo. It's, it's a very taboo. Let's not go there, Kai, please. <laughs> but I can, I can, I can, I can quite easily, quite easily explain it. Um, the law, the BO Act, um, says that uh, other laws. They say it clearly, other laws still prevails. Now, when you look at it, um, it means that organizations are not exempted from that. Are not exempted Automatic. from. From a from uh, tax, um, but to help you out in this case, um, tax department there are time um, frames. There are time frames. Um, if you exceed certain amount of money, then 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 you will not be taxed. Let, let me, because because um, this issue of tax has been going on for for quite for quite uh, some time. There is no automatic exemption. Oh, the minister has the right. the, but every voluntary organization enrolled and compliant may apply with the commission. May apply with the Minister for Finance, in this case with Professor Shikruna, to be exempted from tax. And it's only the minister who decides. But they still have to register but, yes. with the income tax. Yes, yes, definitely. They still definitely, have to register with the income. Definitely, tax. definitely. So what what, what the, the the system basically is that that the VO applies, put sends in an email or a letter, and um, uh, Ministry for Finance it first comes to us to check whether that VO is uh, is enrolled will be enrolled because they, they, they will have the registration number and compliant and, uh, and are working according to the objectives A exactly and they're working according to the objectives and then they will check with uh, within like that yes. and you also mentioned the time frames in order to be able to uh, send in the annual returns do the same time frames apply to also send in statutes so all the other required documents for enrollment or for annual returns? For, so it's for if, annual returns. Uh, if an organization is already enrolled, okay. in order for it to remain compliant, it needs to send in the new the, documentation. The, the, those six documents to, to, to the time frame. The what, time frames are there, yes, they're all. But if, for example, the the committee members of the organization change, then there uh -huh. will need to be the other documents that were submitted. So, the, the list of administrators is as on the last day of the financial year. Right. Okay. If in the meantime they, there are changes, then we, it, the office would appreciate that we are in the know. Right. Why? Because, because if we are not informed, the list of administrators, the, the last list of administrators that we receive, they are the ones responsible for us. No one else. 
we cannot know all of the uh, committees that exist in Malta. We don't know that, all of them. We know some people, especially the ones who are who cause trouble, trouble in the sense, in the good sense of the word. Um, but really and truly, many of our committees are law-abiding citizens and, and, mm -hmm. and they follow the regulations. They, yes, it's true that there are, for example, there are, we have organizations which are run by elderly people. So they have difficulties when it comes to these, to, to, to the annual returns, and that's where we, we give a helping hand. Mm -hmm. And that it also includes uh, sometimes telling them what to, what to do and what to write and, 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 and how. Uh, it's a bit of a hand-holding exercise as well. Um, something that uh, has been, has been uh, mentioned, um, Mr. Roderick said that uh, the annual returns must reach the commissioner within a time frame. So it's three months, four months, eight months, and six months if, you're, if your statute dictates that you have to do all that accounts. Now, so be clear, to be clear, when this was drafted in the law, it was taken into consideration that the financial year is from January to December. But if your financial year is different from, December, from January to December, same procedure applies. So if your financial year ends in February or March or whatever month that is, the three months start from that period. The four months start from that period. So you have to be careful that when your financial year is reaching the end and you're required to submit the annual returns of the commission and within the time frame, three months, four months, six months, and eight months, it depends where, you, where, you, where your organization is, 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 is set, uh, you do it within the time frame. You cannot submit one document, then you submit another document a week later or whatever. Documents must reach the commissioner all together. This is what he was saying. Uh, so. I mean, my question would be, what happens if the organization does not remain compliant? So what happens then? What happens then? We will be sad. We will be angry. No, because of poor work. <laughs> um, in reality, in reality, um, what happens is that the organization cannot apply for funding and then the, the, the commissioner can take action. We prefer the other way around. We prefer that all organizations are compliant. We prefer that if there are, and I am aware that student organizations have problems, especially coming from the past, I'd rather sit down with, um, uh, with a student organization, get them in line. If need be, we waive a certain documentation from the past, not from the present, huh? from the past, and they can move on. I'd rather have it that way um, rather than uh, keep the, the organization in a, in a state of non-compliance. Um, we don't want to burden the organizations with unnecessary bureaucratic um, uh, situations or, or, or um, uh, documentation. Is the, but, the but, CGN. but we do need the organizations to understand that they need to work within a framework. And that is, that is the, the difficulty and the challenge is to strike a balance between those two. Because we have two situations um, which might sound uh, contradictory, but in reality they can, be, they, they can live um, uh, close to each other. Thank you. Um, um, I, can I, um, before you just mentioned uh, a website, the Malta CVS. Um, I'm going to explain in a uh, in few, in few words what it means. The minute the organization um, becomes, um, is enrolled with the commissioner, it automatically becomes a full member of the Malta Council for the Voluntary Sector. 
the council consists of a board. I think it's about 13 people sit on the board and they are elected by the BOs. So each BO has the right to elect uh, a member in this board. So being an enrolled commissioner entitles you to, uh, to become a member of, of this organization. They have uh, places, headquarters is in Valletta, they have a place in Brabat, they're building a, another one in Marsashlok, uh, they have now a place in Gozo, uh, and they're spreading around. Um, so the Malta CVS stands for Malta Council for the Bonus Sector. If you go to their website, um, you will notice they have funds, they have quite a lot of things there for students, for everything. but these are all for organizations that are enrolled with the Commissioner for Voluntary Organization. Now, another thing, and I stop here, um, what happens if an organization does not submit annual returns? Regretfully, I have to go again in this subject because it comes back to me to haunt me in a way. Uh, as Roderick said, we don't like it, but recently I uh, took action against 21 organization. The lawyer, in-house lawyer, gave me everything. He uh, passed on the, uh, the names of the organization to the government gazette, where we stated that these organization are not trustworthy and we are suspending them for good. And regretfully, I have to cancel them from the registry. So it's best, my, my only advice is communication. If you have any problem, contact the, our office, contact KSU, and we'll try to find a solution for everything. We don't like to take action for anything. We want more NGOs to be in instead of being out. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, on that note, if there are any more questions, which I don't think there are, um, I want to thank both Sister Kala and Sarah Brooks for their uh, right. time today, for giving us uh, the brief presentation and for the information they have provided. Obviously, feel free to contact us if you have any questions. We'll be able to both. Um, pass on the contact details to, of, of Mr. Mikala and Mr. Hadou, and we'll be able to help you ourselves as KSU um, to start the process. Um, we can share, um, speakers have given us permission to share the presentations with you, so kindly contact us if you would like um, access to the presentation. Uh, apart from that, I thank you all for being with us uh, this morning, for attending the workshop. Obviously, we'll be having more of this kind later on. Um, thank you and have a good day. Thank you. 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 Thank